welcome back. Libyan pro-government forces have seized control of yet another central district of Sirte. This is an effort to flush out the last Islamic State group fighters in the coastal city. Since the beginning of August, dozens of U.S. airstrikes have helped to weaken IS's hold on Sirte, which the jihadists seized last year and established as their main base outside Syria and Iraq. Forces aligned with Libya's UN-backed government advance in the fight against IS in Sirte. The pro-government forces have taken one of the last districts in central Sirte held by the ISIS militants. The jihadists struck back with two suicide car bomb attacks but failed to hit the targets. One of the bombers detonated his explosives close to a group of soldiers and journalists. The advance by pro-GNA troops comes a day after the loyalists cleared and demined areas of the city captured in earlier clashes. The forces are three months into a campaign to oust ISIS from their former North African stronghold and have encircled the militants in a shrinking section of the city centre. Since August 1, their progress has been aided by U.S. airstrikes on ISIS vehicles, weapons and fighting positions. The U.S. Africa Command says it has so far carried out a total of 48 strikes. The government-backed forces have been carrying out their own regular airstrikes over the Mediterranean coastal city with a fleet of aging fighter jets. At least eight combatants from those forces had been killed and more than 80 wounded in Tuesday's clashes. ISIS seized control of Sirte last year, turning it into a base for Libyan and foreign jihadists and extending its control over 250 kilometers of Libya's Mediterranean coastline. Losing cert will be a major setback for the ultra-hardline Islamist group, which has already lost ground to U.S.-backed military campaigners in Iraq and Syria. Peer Report, Ain Seven. Malawi police arrest an HIV-positive man paid by parents to have sex with scores of young girls. Eric Aniva, who is HIV-positive, unabashedly claimed he has had sex with more than 100 women, most of them underage. Some were as young as 12. Aniva is known as a hyena. The term is used in certain villages in the southeastern African country. It refers to a male who's hired to have sex with women and girls for ritualistic purposes. On Tuesday, Aniva was arrested on orders from President Peter Mutarika, who learned of the incidents through an international interview. One of Aniva's wives sees nothing wrong with her husband's practices, instead worrying about life after, should her husband be found guilty. Now that he's in prison, I'm starving. I have children that he was feeding. I am failing to take care of my children alone. I don't know what crime he has committed. They have locked him up. But look, there is no evidence of any crime. He was at his home where they picked him and then sent him to prison. When I went there, even himself does not understand why he's being kept in prison. There are several circumstances in which a hyena might be used, but they are all centered on the idea of sexual cleansing. In many rural areas of the country, a recent widow is expected to have sex with a member of her husband's family to exercise the spirit of the deceased. Residents in this village have been practicing the tradition for years. Here in the villages, our chiefs have not formally asked us to stop this ancestral practice or ritual. It is something that is happening, and as I speak now, this practice is in almost all the areas in the district. People are doing it. The president, NGOs and health and humanitarian organizations hope to end sexual cleansing. The president has also ordered investigations into the parents involved in Aniva's many cleansings. Bureau Report, ANN7. South Sudan's former vice president and opposition leader Rik Macher has left the country. He left the country to escape government forces who were pursuing him since he withdrew from the capital during fierce fighting over a month ago.
South Sudan's former vice president and opposition leader Riek Mishar has left the country for a neighboring state. This after several weeks when he withdrew from the capital Juba during fierce fighting with the government troops. Spokesman James Gadet Duck declined to disclose Mashar's whereabouts. A statement issued by the leadership of the SPLA in opposition said he had left on Wednesday to a safe country within the region. Reports have suggested Mashar is currently in the Democratic Republic of Congo in Kinshasa and wants to go as soon as possible to Ethiopia. Mashar led a two-year rebellion against forces loyal to his longtime rival President Salva Kiir before the two sides reached a peace deal in August 2015. Under the deal, Mashar returned to Juba in April to resume his role as vice president. But fighting fled last month, leading Mashar to withdraw his forces from Juba around mid-July. On Wednesday, South Sudan's new vice president vehemently warned that Mashar should stay out of politics to allow peace. Bureau Report, ANN7. Houses have been destroyed and several villages submerged over after flooding uh, triggered by torrential rainfall swept across Sudan, leaving thousands of people stranded in villages in the eastern state of Kasala. Aid workers struggled to get hundreds of tons of aid to people made homeless by widespread flooding in Sudan. This after torrential rains severed a highway and other roads. Trucks and vehicles loaded with relief supplies and construction materials remain stranded in the eastern state of Kasala as authorities battled to repair damaged roads. Aid workers said it would be days before relief reached all of those affected by the worst flooding to hit the impoverished region in years. Kasala, bordering Eritrea, is one of the worst hit areas after the river gash burst its banks, flooding villages tens of kilometers away. Thousands of houses were destroyed and several villages submerged after heavy rainfall killed at least 100 people nationwide, including 25 in Kasala. Bureau report, ANN7. A severely drought-hit community in Mozambique has constructed a water reservoir in anticipation of coming rains. This as the end of the El Nino season approaches. Tungon Hammond's only water source used by people and livestock had in recent time become contaminated. Humanitarian agencies need $1.2 billion in critical aid for seven drought-stricken countries in southern Africa. The countries are the hardest hit by the El Nino weather phenomenon, which continues to devastate crops across the region. Currently, an estimated 12.3 million people are at risk. According to Southern Africa's Regional Interagency Standing Committee, food stocks are exhausted and access to safe drinking water is limited. The hardest hit countries are Angola, Lesotho, Madagascar, Malawi, Mozambique, Swaziland and Zimbabwe. The United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs warned that if the agencies fail to raise the funds in time, the consequences of the drought would be catastrophic. Zimbabwe, Malawi and Mozambique have all issued drought alerts in recent months as thousands of cattle die, reservoirs shrink and harvests fail. According to the United Nations, more than 60 million people in 22 countries across southern and eastern Africa, Central America and the Pacific are facing food shortages caused by El Nino. Two-thirds, the UN says, are in East and Southern Africa. 643,000 drought-related livestock deaths have been reported in Botswana, Swaziland, South Africa, Namibia and Zimbabwe alone. The U.S., Britain and the EU have pledged $300 million, 72 million pounds and 60 million euros to the SADC appeal, respectively. With its beaches and year-round sun, Tunisia is not the most obvious a home for the winter sport of ice hockey. But one man is quite determined to make it happen. Two years ago, Ihab Ayed quit his job in finance to realize his dream of creating the North African country's first ice hockey team. Ayed had dreamt of a Tunisian team to play the game internationally ever since he first learned at the age of five how to hit a black rubber puck on ice. Very clearly, our objective is to become a recognized federation in Tunisia. 
That's a personal goal, and I think that we will be able to move swiftly towards this. It took six years, from 2006 to 2012, to bring together 40 players from around the world to form a team. With the help of social media and tips from friends, he cobbled together a team of amateurs and professionals, all of whom have at least one Tunisian parent. I've been curious about this for years. I don't speak Arabic. I'm not Muslim. I wasn't raised as a Tunisian and I wanted to find what was there in me that is Tunisian. When Ihab contacted me about the project of an association, I wanted to join the cause and play for Tunisia and also feel wholly Tunisian. Ayed hopes that the Tunisian Ice Hockey Association, which is registered in France, can now become a legal entity in the North African country. The dream, he says, is to see Tunisia become an affiliated member of the International Ice Hockey Federation with its own Olympic ice rink. Bureau Report, ANN7. Burundi held a beauty contest on Sunday despite chaos in the Eastern African country. Medical student Angie Bernice Ngavire was crowned Miss Burundi. The country has been in chaos since President Pierre Nkurunziza extended his rule in 2015. Medical student Anga Bernice Ngabire is crowned Miss Burundi. Ngabire won the coveted title hosted at the Safari Gate Hotel in Burundi's capital Bujumbura as a large majority of Burundians followed final Miss Burundi 2016-2017 contest on Sunday. The future doctor says the platform will enable her to contribute towards improving the troubled country's health care system. As a medical student, I choose to do a project about medicine, so this is related to public health, and I hope I'll be able to do it, and I hope to get your support to help me. The beauty queen was not the public favourite leading up to the finals. When it came to the final moments, she wowed the judges with her project presentation. I was surprised like everyone. Angie Bernice wasn't the favourite in the polls or even the SMS vote, but she surprised the jury with her project presentation. Other contestants wish to continue with their projects post Miss Burundi. In any competition, there can only be one winner, and this is not where our projects stop. We intend to develop and go far. We have come a long way, and this has been a good experience. Thank you. Mona Wilder was named first princess and Onella became the second runner-up. Bureau Report, ANN7. And that's all the stories making headlines for this week on Africa at a glance. From me, Lesejo Mokonani and the team, obrigado, ciao.